Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> before I start, I want to give a little perspective on, you know, uh, coming back to Marquette after many, many years, because when I look around, I'm you, and I'm you, and the reality is that there's no difference between where I was and where you are, and I don't have a leg up on you and you sitting right next to me at that time. Um, I was born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, not the sexiest, most exciting city in the world, and not the best neighborhood in Pittsburgh even. I grew up in a family that was not poor, but not rich. I had no business people in my family. Um, I was not an entrepreneur at the age of 10 onward. I was okay in school, did a little sports. At Marquette, I was at my best a B student and had to work pretty hard to get and stay there. I really wasn't outstanding in anything, except maybe in my RA's mind in Schrader Hall, when uh, for a few things that I'd rather not talk about in public. <laughs> but aside from that, I was a you know, normal average uh, college student. And if you had told me then, sitting here, that someday I would travel to 50 countries, work in almost 40, live in four, that I would have run in my early 30s a $100 million business covering all of Latin America and the Caribbean, that I would found, build, and sell to the Coca-Cola company a coconut water business, which at the time, like many of you right now, don't have a clue what it is and have never heard of it, and like many of you, don't like it. I wouldn't have liked it then either. If you had told me that, I would have said, you're nuts. You're nuts, there's no way. But yet, that's where I am, and that's been my life. And it's been random, it's been a lot of luck, there's probably been some fate involved, but probably more than anything, it's been this journey for me has been a conscious choice of finding and pursuing my dreams. And the phrase I like to use for that is cracking my life open. And so what I hope to offer you today and to leave you with is just a few thoughts on your pursuit to finding your dreams and pursuing your dreams. Not your parents' dreams, not your aunt and uncle's dreams, not your professor's dreams, not your friend's dreams, certainly not my dreams, your dreams. And if I can do that, and in a small way, help you begin to think about cracking your own life open, I'll consider that a success. So let me take you back to January, actually March of 2004. I'm living in El Salvador, San Salvador, El Salvador, with my wife, two very young girls, uh, two and one and, 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 and a newborn. We've been living there for about four years and we are 90 days away from launching Zico at a trade show in New York, the fancy food show in New York in June 2004. Different packaging, a couple different flavors, but we're gearing up to launch. Now I still have a day job. I'm running this business crossing Latin America and the Caribbean. I'm traveling like crazy. I just get back from a five-day trip somewhere in South America, get home in time to help my wife bathe our little girls, sing them some songs, put them to bed, and we're just about to sit down for a nice, whoops, why am I missing one slide here, one photo here, but that's okay. We're living the, the high life as expatriates. Uh, the company rents for us a, a great, beautiful house. You can't see I'm missing a photo in the center of this elegant dining room we have. This is our housekeeper, Juana, that has just made her signature dish for me, shrimp enchiladas. It's, it's, it's her homecoming dish for me. I put on a little music, open a bottle of wine. Moore and I are just about to sit down to dinner when my phone rings. I should have turned it off. I shouldn't have it at the table, but I did. So I look at it. And it's my sister, Mary Beth. And so I say to Moore, yeah, it's my sister. And she says, don't take it. 
Like Maura knows, my wife Maura knows my sister Mary Beth, loves her, knows we're very close. But she also knows this is not personal. It's business. My sister Mary Beth is a, um, lives and works in Chicago. She's an, a brilliant architect and designer. She's done all the branding and packaging design for Zico. And we're gearing up for this trade show. If she's calling me, it's because it has something to do with our packaging production. If we miss the packaging production, supply chain people, we miss the manufacturing production. We miss manufacturing produc production. We miss the ship date from Brazil. We miss the ship date. We miss the trade show. We miss the trade show. We might miss a whole selling season. We miss a season. We might miss a year. And there's competitors out there. And, and, and this is, it's game on right now. So I take the call. I'm on for no more than 10 minutes, hang up the phone, sit back down to dinner, smiley, happy, ready to enjoy it with my beautiful wife. And she sits up from across the table and says, it will not be this way. It will not be this way. Mark, come on. You just got back from a five-day trip. You're working all the time. You hardly see the girls. We can't even sit down for a five-minute dinner by ourselves. It, it's not working. It can't, it can't be this way. It can't be this way. There's got to be another way. We've got to draw some lines. My first thought is, was she kidding me? It's a five-minute phone call. What's going to happen when things get real tough when we're launching and trying to build this business? Doesn't she remember how big this is for us? The impact we can make in the developing world, the impact we can make for health on consumers, what it means to us personally. Didn't she agree to go with it? Maybe I need to put my foot down and tell her, no, this is the way it's going to be. This is what it means to be an entrepreneur. You want this lifestyle. You want this house and a nanny and all these things. Maybe this is what it takes to make that happen. Fortunately, divine intervention, I shut my mouth. I didn't say any of that. I went quiet and I paused and I took a moment and I tried to listen to her, to me, to something bigger, something deeper. And I got it. I got it. And I said, I understand, you're raising the bar. How do we go after the success in business without losing ourselves, without losing our soul, without losing our connection, without losing our, our health, our marriage, our children? What I realized was she was telling me, you gotta make it personal. For years I've heard and had heard people say, ah, it's, it's, not, it's nothing personal just business. Sorry we had to fire you today. It's nothing personal, it's just business. I never liked that phrase. I ne it never resonated with me. And during this process, I got it. I think it's bad. I think it's a bad idea. I think it's bad for living, but I also think it's bad for business. And I realized particularly if we we're going to launch a new business and commit our lives to this and our finances and ask family to invest and commit probably a decade of our lives to this, it better be personal. It better work for us. It better work on multiple measures, not just the top line, not just the financial bottom line, but the personal bottom line. So I started to build in measurements. How many nights should I try to be home? How many nights should I try to have dinner by 6.30? How am I gonna make sure I stay healthy, we stay connected? How do we make sure that this works for us personally? So that that's, was a big breakthrough very important, critical to our success, but was it sufficient? Let me tell you another story and back up further. So 18 months before we launched, in January of 2003, I'm in South Beach, Miami, uh, with a friend hanging out in one of the cool bars on Collins Avenue, and um, we're talking about life. And this guy says to me, Mark, look, I, Everybody knows you're going to leave international paper at some point. Have you ever thought about starting your own business? And my response is, no, never have. I'm not an idea guy. I know people that are serial entrepreneurs, that they've done this again and again. 
that's not me, you know. Maybe I'd join a startup if I could find somebody with a cool idea, somebody that has the financing. Maybe I can run it or play a role, but, but I'm, not, I'm not the startup guy. And he says, Mark, the only difference between you and an entrepreneur is an idea, and you're as capable of, as anyone of having an idea. And as obvious as that, that, as that was, it was a lightning bolt for me. Oh, wow, I can do this too. So I get on the plane the next day, fly back to San Salvador, and I start brainstorming ideas. Notebooks full of ideas. Over the next two weeks, ideas, ideas, ideas. And I finally start to sit down with Mora in our favorite chair or out on our patio, open another bottle of wine, and talk about the ideas. So I'm, I'm flipping through pages one night. And I say, yes, yes, this one, this one. The dairy industry. I've been researching a little bit about the dairy industry. It's very fragmented. There's a lot of different dairies in Central America. They're very inefficient. They're going to get crushed when they open up their borders and the U.S. comes in to compete. Maybe we can consolidate them, make them more efficient, do a roll-up. I don't know what the heck that meant, but it sounded very uh, finance, very MBA-ish to say that. And my wife looks at me and says, dairy? Why do I want to be in the dairy industry? What's so exciting about that? Why, why is that any different than packaging? I'm like, oh. Okay, okay, scratch that one, scratch that one. <laughs> Keep flipping and I come to another one, trucking, trucking. So th there's this expectation that when, uh, at the time we had recently signed NAFTA, the fr fair trade agreement with, uh, with Mexico, the free trade agreement, fair is questionable. Um, <laughs> And they were in the process of negotiating a Central America free trade agreement. So the thought was there's going to be a big opportunity from trucking from Central America to Mexico feeding into the U.S. So I'm talking about trucking, getting all excited about trucking. And my wife gives me that look again that says, uh, what, I want to be in trucking? So I realized we needed a different approach. Um, we had, I had to think about ways that it was not only going to be personal for us, but that it hit a higher level, something that worked for us on multiple levels. So I started to develop a series of screens to vet these ideas. One was the classic business stuff. Is it growth potential, good margins, competitive dynamics, barriers to entry, all that stuff. Another was personal. Does it work for us um, on our lifestyle? Does it fit with our values? But I realized that I, I needed to bring in a little bit more of that Jesuit view, a little bit more of that Marquette view. And that was, did it have a purpose? Was this something bigger than us? Something that we could commit our lives to? Something that made an impact in the world? Something that could be done in a socially and environmentally responsible way? Uh, something that would positively in people, impact people's lives? And particularly, once you have kids in your world, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm skipping one part. This is my um, sister, um, with a friend drinking coconut water on a beach. Um, I'll, I'll actually come back to that one. You know what, I'm so sorry, my slides did get a little screwed up, Professor Dana, it's my fault on that. But basically, the goal was how to make it, how to make it um, have purpose, something bigger than us. And so I wanna talk about that on this coconut water slide, if I can get back to it. There it is. So why coconut water and how did that fit in? So any of you that have been to the tropics may have experienced what we did. I first went to the tropics as a Peace Corps volunteer, fresh out of Marquette. I was in Central America. And you see it all over the place. You see it in the beaches. You see it on the side of roads. People drink it um, at, a, at a little stand. They serve it in restaurants. It's a pretty good mixer, a little rum, a little vodka. It's also a phenomenal hangover cure, but I, you didn't hear that from me. Um, <laughs> My wife worked in public health, and she was aware of its uses in rural communities as a rehydration so solution, as a source of clean water, of a source of electrolytes, and it's generally known as a healthy, replenishing beverage. And so what we realized was that there was an opportunity to make a bigger impact on this. And so we set out with four main goals in starting Zico. The first was 20 years in the future to see kids um, young adults, uh, even adults, uh, drinking coconut water versus other high sugar artificial beverages. We're not going to solve world peace, but if we can contribute in a small way to people li living more healthy, actual, natural lives, that's a plus. Second, there's 85 countries in the world that grow coconuts. None of them are rich. 
Coconuts don't grow in Europe. They don't grow in Amer the, the North America. They don't grow in South Africa. It's a very narrow belt around the tropics, and that correlates highly with poverty, development indexes, other things. Those countries need alternative agricultural products. Coconuts are a massive global commodity, but the water was generally thrown away. So we believe that we could create massive uh, economic development in a socially and environmentally sustainable way by launching this new industry. Third, we wanted to build a brand that would stand for something good, stand for healthy, natural, active living, but also be cool. Too many of the brands that kind of meet that angle aren't cool. They're not something people want to carry around or be proud to be associated with. We wanted to try to bring those two together and also, frankly, build, do something that would last forever. A brand, theoretically, if done and built correctly, can last forever. And the fourth element we wanted to achieve was to create an environment where all of us, employees, investors, other people, had an opportunity to learn, contribute, and grow. So those are the objectives we set out to build in, uh, in Zico. So now let me, let me fast forward um, another year. So we now know that the business is personal. We now know that it has a um, higher purpose. Again, those are necessary, but are they sufficient? So this is now January of 2005. We did make it to the trade show. We had a successful launch. I quit my job. We moved back to New York, buy a house in New Jersey, uh, basically old classic ho home, um, and things are going great. We launched Zico in, in New York. We're having some great response from some very influential consumers. We're getting into the yoga studios. We're in with triathletes and runners and cyclists. It's going great. The, the response is excellent. Taste profile is a challenge, but people get used to that. Love the replenishment properties. Drink it at the end of the marathon when you could care less what it tastes like. You just need the electrolytes but the response is working. We're getting phenomenal retail execution in, in a small but very influential number of accounts in New York. Natural food stores, gourmet stores, yoga studios, gyms, um, et cetera. Um, I get the whole family involved. This is my wife and kids cracking open boxes to give them out at, 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 at an event. It's all going well, we're building, but I'm a little worried because now it's still winter uh, in New York, as it would be here. And, and people don't drink many beverages in, in winter. All beverages go down, let alone something like coconut water that's associated with the tropics. So I'm getting a little worried. Our sales are not quite there to cover, not even close to covering our expenses, but I'm just not sure we have the cash to make it through. But I figure if we can make it through the winter, we'll be good by spring, we catch the seasonality and we're good. Everything sounds good until I get this in the mail one day. So this says New Jersey, but it's actually from the FDA that our product has been embargoed. So around this time, I have a personal coach that I'm working with, an Australian guy named Jeff, and we're on the phone, you know, doing our regular coaching session, and, and we, we have a call one day, and in his annoyingly cheery Australian accent, Jeff says, hey Mark, how's it going? <laughs> and I say, Jeff, not well. <laughs> I just got a notice from the FDA that our recent importation has been embargoed. We can't sell it. Not only that, there's a risk that I may have to recall everything that's out there. There's nothing wrong with the product. It's a paperwork glitch. When our producer in Brazil filled out certain paperwork, it wasn't correct. The FDA didn't check it initially. Now that we start importing container loads, they're checking every little detail, and there was some, some problem with the paperwork. So, Jeff, until I resolve that, we got a big problem. I got no product to sell, so I got no money coming in. Um, I can't import any more until I correct this problem. We've burned through almost all of our investors' cash. We've put every penny we had into the business. In fact, we went and borrowed a hundred and some thousand dollars from our families to be able to buy a house. I don't know that we're gonna make it through this, Jeff. It might be over. We might lose the house, we might lose the business. It might be over. So Jeff goes quiet for a minute and then says, Mark, um, go to your front door. I said, Jeff, what are you talking about? Go to my front door. He said, just, just humor me. Walk, walk to your front door. So I go to the front door. He says, look outside. 
do you see a white van in your, in your driveway? I said, no, Jeff, there's no white van in my driveway. He said, okay. Do you see two guys in white suits? I said, no, Jeff, there's, there's no guys in white suits. What are you talking about? And he said, Mark, are, so you're telling me that there's not two guys in white suits that are going to put you in a straitjacket, throw you in a van, and take you away for the next 20 years? He said, no, Jeff. Then what are you complaining about? <laughs> what are you complaining about? If it's not going to be this, anybody recognize the movie? One Flew the Cuckoo's Nest. Good. If it's not going to be that, what are you worried about, Mark? You're young. You got a beautiful family. You're well educated. You went to Marquette for, you know, after all. You can, you'll probably figure out a way to get through this. But if not, you gave it a shot. You'll find something else. You'll figure it out. It took a while for that to sink in, but what I realized he was saying is, I had to know I already won. I had to know I already won. And the reality was, it did take some time, but it sunk in. And I think back to good old Jesuit uh, education, it's a higher perspective, it's a deeper perspective that says the reality is, we all won. We're alive, first of all. Second of all, if you're here, you're winning in life. You are. Anything from here forward is just additional wins. All that other stuff is baggage. All that other stuff is baggage. The recognition that we already won was critical for us at this stage. Now, that all sounds well and good, but we still got a problem, right? I've got product stuck in, the, in customs. I got no product to sell. I got no money to sell. How does this help me do anything with that? Well, what I realized over our nine years of, of building Zico was that those three things, making it personal, having a higher purpose, and knowing we already won, helped us get through anything. Because it helped us, it helped me in particular, be present in situations. Not be worried about what's gonna happen tomorrow, not be worried about what happened yesterday, but to be present and be able to focus on the situation in front of me. I had a good enough relationship with my wife. I was home at dinner most nights when I wasn't traveling at 6.30. So she gave me the latitude to say, all right, you need to travel for, for, for 10 days to Asia to sign up new supply, go for it, we're good. I was healthy enough that I, could, I wasn't sick, I could take care of myself and do what I needed to do. I knew my daughters, so I felt oh, comfortable spending some time and working hard. We were aligned as a family, and I was aligned so that we could get through almost anything. So in that particular situation, what happened was we worked through it. It took about six weeks, tough negotiations with the FDA, tough negotiations with distributors, retailers, investors, but we figured it out. We were able to, um, we had to destroy a lot of product, we did donate most of it to a tsunami relief effort that was uh, after a major tsunami in the, in, in, in the, in the Southeast Asia. Um, we were able to start to import product again. We corrected the paperwork glitch. I brought in some more investment capital and we kept the, the, the doors open. And fortunately, we avoided a recall which could have uh, put at risk the whole company. Okay, so those are, those are the three main lessons I wanted to give you on, on making it personal, uh, having a higher purpose and knowing you already won. Now, what do you do with that now, right? You're sophomore, junior, seniors at Marquette. How do you apply this in your life? Not 10 years from now, not five years from now, not at graduation, but now. And I believe whether you have a dying passion to go start a business or social enterprise or nonprofit, whether you, it's the furthest thing from your mind and you have no interest in doing it, or you're like me, somewhere in between until about 2003, that maybe you could, maybe you couldn't. There's a couple lessons I'd like to, uh, thoughts I'd like to leave you with that I, I hope are applicable in a sense. The first is know and love yourself. I found that this is, um, was so important to me in my life and business career and, and not common in the business world, not common that people really know themselves. And I don't mean what you look like, how tall you are, what your grades are. I mean the deeper stuff. 
Who are you? What, what values do you hold? What matters to you? Um, what do you? What's important to you in the world? What's the stuff that's deeper than just on the surface? What's the stuff that um, you, you want to use to resonate with your life? For years, I, I've done hundreds, if not thousands, of employee reviews and development plans and things like that over the years. And I, I, I finally reached a point where I realized we do it all wrong. Most of these company evaluations, what they focus on is filling in gaps, right? What are your weaknesses? How do you improve them? What gaps do you have? How do you fill them? I think that's a waste of time. Focus on your strengths. If we spend 10 times the effort on focusing and building and loving our strengths as we do worrying about our weaknesses, I'm convinced we'll all have more successful, enjoyable, and engaging lives. Ask the big questions. Why are we here? This isn't just garbage. The, the, the philosophy classes are not a requirement, Marquette, to torture you, okay? <laughs> Especially as business majors. They have relevance. Why are we here? The, if any any TED, TED Talk fans, some, one of the greatest ones is, is ask, what's your why? I think it's Simon, I forget his last name. Find your why. Why are you here? What does that mean? What problem do you want to address? When you look around the world, the world or your neighborhood or your community or your house or your school, what problems do you want to address? Those are the sort of questions that I think will, uh, and I'm sorry, one last one is, what is your uh, best and highest use? It's a phrase I stole from my father-in-law, another Jesuit educated uh, man, who always challenged me on that early on in this process, is thinking about what is my best and highest use? And I believe those questions will help you tremendously on this journey. You're not gonna answer them, right? You're not gonna answer them right away. The answers don't really matter at least today for you. But asking the question, I believe, is a fundamental part of developing a personal and even a business strategy that's, that's winning. Try on different lives for size. I haven't seen any of these, but I've been hearing about these virtual um, try-on rooms, vir virtual um, dressing rooms. Why don't we have that for life? Why is this this expectation you gotta jump into a career? I'm amazed how many people get into a career or a field or a company or a job without really knowing what it's like. Try it on, talk to people, go to conferences, talk to graduates, interview people, find out what their life is like. Internships are great for that. I don't care if you have to sweep the floors to get a sense of what an organization is like, to try it on. Your life, you, you all, it's, it's cliche now how many times you're gonna change your careers, right? But expect that, embrace that, and don't assume you have to settle on something right away. It can take years to fi figure that out but be comfortable with the idea that you're trying that on. Life, roles, companies, careers, passions, they're gonna morph and change, you gotta try them on. Find your jobs, don't wait for them to find you. So this is, I got this from somewhere, I don't know, this is a job fair for, for I think in China, for the tech industry. I think it was from Xbox. So one guy sitting there waiting for about a thousand resumes, you know, good, good luck with that. And this is uh, Ruka, anyone know Ruka? Surf brand based in Southern California. Uh, my experience was, no offense to the career services department, but the probability of you finding a, a passion from companies coming on campus is pretty low. And if you're fortunate enough to be in the top 5% of your class, it's probably harder because you've got so many people coming to you, you don't take the time to actually think about what you want. So if you're not in that top 5%, celebrate, it's good. That's where I was. I found my experience was I interviewed way too many companies and looked at way too many jobs that weren't right for me, both in undergraduate and in grad school. So I was a slow learner. And, and it wasn't until I took my job search on myself and focused on industries, specialties, functions that, were, that I was excited about that I finally landed on things. Peace Corps was part of that process, very informal route to that, and even my role with International Paper. They weren't recruiting on my, at Duke for the MBA program. I went to them because of what I found and liked. And so I encourage you to own it yourself. Don't expect it to come from you, and I think it'll work better for you. Live below your means. Um, 
I think that this is one of the least talked about things in the professional world for uh, young people coming out. And it's that this, this, this risk of letting your income, letting your consumption grow at the same rate as your income. No worse way to be in a difficult position in your career than to have golden handcuffs where you're trapped into a job or life because, oh God, the money's so good. And I like my car and my apartment and these other things. Try to avoid that for as long as you can. Live below your means. And the beauty is, you guys are great at this, right? You know how to live cheap today. Don't lose that. That's one of your greatest assets. I didn't have a real job until I was 28. I went from Marquette to the Peace Corps to graduate school. And, and so I was 28 years old before I had anything more than I had $200 a month income in the Peace Corps. My wife went through a similar experience. And the beauty was we were in our late 20s before, really early 30s before we correlated. Uh, until that time, we had no correlation between money and happiness. None. It didn't matter. We backpacked. We stayed in hostels. We slept on friends' floors. You figured it out. And we had debt. We had over $100,000 in debt when we finished grad school. And the beauty was it forced us to live mean, lean and mean to pay that off. But once we paid that off, we kept that difference going in the savings. We did not increase our style of living significantly. And that gave us the nest egg to start Zico. That was the funds that allowed us to get Zico at least uh, out of the gate. Fear is natural, standing still is not. One of my uh, favorite quotes is uh, the painter, Southwest painter, George O'Keefe, who said something like, I've been afraid every day of my life, but I've never let it stop me from doing what I want. And I think I found that to be very important in my life because the reality is, the scary fact is, the fear never goes away. It doesn't go away. I'm afraid, I was terrified, well, I wouldn't say terrified, but I was afraid coming here to speak to you all. You know, I had to sit outside, kind of get myself ready. I'm afraid to figure out what's next in my life. I don't know what it's going to be. It gives me butterflies in my stomach to think about it. But the reality is it never goes away. You just get better at dealing with it, better at accepting it, better at not letting it hold you back. So I encourage you, whatever that is, as you go through this process of finding your dreams and pursuing them, to not let fear hold you back. And that's, uh, that's basically the message I wanted to give you, that I hope that you're already thinking about it. I'm sure you all are, maybe too much in some ways, what your life is, what you're going to do with your life. But I encourage you to think about it as cracking it open, as looking inside of you to find what meaning you want to have in life, what impact you want to make in the world, and going for it, going for it with, uh, with the energy and passion and, and enthusiasm. Thank you.